always always have someone you can bounce things off um, in a very adult to adult like manner. So you have assumptions more than listening yeah. to the other person. You have your own assumptions that you bring to the table, and then you want them to meet it. And when it doesn't meet, it causes a disagreement. So now that's slightly different. That's an expectation. I'm gonna try and compliment him in a way that's gonna kind of make him want to enhance his abilities in whatever he's doing but in other spheres of life as well. I'd like to change the way I approach marriage or at least make it better by consciously making an effort as much as I can in the things I do in my marriage. We hear this constantly. Lady Khadija? Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad, right? One plus one? Two. Oh, Two? Oh, I don't know. It's synergy three. <laughs> I don't know if you're trying to get me to say here. There is no right or wrong answer. That's the beauty of it. My name's Abbas. Um, I think 36 years old, married to Shaheen. Uh, I've got two lovely kids. I've got a, my son, Hussein Yahya, who's eight years old. Uh, my daughter, Zainab Fatima, who's uh, six years old. To me, I've seen how marriage has helped me uh, as a person. Um, and it's a tough process. Marriage isn't an easy process because it really forces you to have to face yourself in the mirror and realize some of the defects you have and some of the things you've got to work through your own personality. Um, and it's because of, I guess, having seen what, how much it's helped me as a person. Um, it's just from there that in about 2008, uh, I just, we started this support group and it just seemed to have grown from there. How did, how did you prepare for the step of marriage? Oh, myself? Have you got a degree in husbandry? <laughs> I don't. Uh, I have a degree in marketing, bachelor's. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Hussein. I'm 23 years old and I work at Ahl Bay TV as a marketing manager. Uh, but in terms of preparation to marriage, I have, I've always been an observer. I mean, that's the kind of person that I am. Before I undertake a challenge, I like to observe things. So, for example, before I would, let's say, play tennis, I would look at how the professionals play tennis and I would try to be like them or play like them. And if I, similarly with football and driving, so let's say if I, while I was learning to drive, even before that, I was in the passenger seat, I always, I always used to look at the driver, see how he moves, drives, steers the wheel. So I've always been someone that observes before taking on the challenge myself. So in terms of preparing for marriage, even though I had, uh, I hadn't been married before getting married, if that makes sense, I, I'd always looked at other people who are married, learn from them, learn from their experiences. That's very interesting because we learn a lot from other people. And um, that shows me that other people and people close to you make a huge difference in your marriage and how you think. When I f came across or when I found out about Zahra, initially I didn't know her personally. I just knew of her family and I was very close to her family without knowing her. So I was very close with her uncle, with her grandparents. I was very, very close with her grandparents. Um, so I'd always known that you know what, the family of the background is, is, is ideal for, uh, to sort of get married into. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Zahra, I'm 22, I work at Ahul Bay TV in the production department. I took some advice from one of my other friends uh, who said uh, that if you want to look at how good a girl is, always try to observe two things. Try to observe how the mother is, and secondly, if you live in East Africa or if your girl is from East Africa, as is common, in Africa that people live close to each other, ask the neighbours about the family. Now obviously she doesn't live in Africa, she lives in, the, in, in North America. But I, knowing the family again, I, I, I just sort of went on with that and I started to get to know her better and Alhamdulillah so far so good. Okay, so you've done it by observation. Yes. How did you, Zahra, how did you prepare for this stuff? Um, well, I kind of, I, I would observe as well, like I used to observe my parents, like they've been married for 25 years now. And um, and I notice how how they behave with each other. They're always together. They have that closeness, and I realized that that's what I wanted in a marriage and stuff. We got married on the twenty fourth of August, two thousand thirteen, seventeenth Shawwal, uh, fourteen thirty four A H.
So according to my calculations, it's going to be two months in two days. So I'm just going to bring Rizwan and Zahra in as well, okay? Observation. You probably agree? I think that's definitely one element of it. Yeah. But other things you can do to try and prepare for marriage or try and understand how to, how to, um, how to be in a married relationship. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Rizwan. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Zahra. I am 26 years old. I'm 23 years old. And we've been married for just over one year now. Yes. One of the things I used to do personally was um, uh, go on forums and read about other people's problems. Um, and that way you get a sort of peek into the kind of issues that other people are having and getting input from other people about how to resolve those issues. And by that you kind of understand what kind of issues you can potentially face in your own situation once you are married and, uh, and the kind of things you might be able to, do to so give me an example. resolve them. Uh, I can't think of any specific examples right now, but usually the, the main, the main um, issue, like the common theme to all the problems would be a lack of communication. Um, I hadn't thought of that before and I certainly think that's a very good idea um, considering I'm just new to this uh, you know, new to this journey myself, so it might be a good idea for myself to also do the same, to go on the internet or just speak to more more people who, are, who have been in this uh, journey for a while now and just to seek their opinion about, about marriage and for them to counsel me in terms of what issues I should be aware of. It could be in terms of uh, maybe perhaps when it comes to children, what I should uh, know whilst having children or how to uh, bring a child up in today's day and age, etc. So I, I think that's the route that I might consider going down myself, inshallah. What does that mean? Tell me in English. What do you mean by lack of communication? So you, what's, not what's happening enough? <laughs> not no, what's happening enough, no, no. <laughs> yeah, so what does this mean? Because it's such a massive cliche we hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reason Definitely. for marriage breakdown? Breakdown, um, uh, breakdown of communication. Think... What does it actually mean in words? Well, lack of communication. Yeah, lack of communication. Communication between the, the two couples themselves. So what does it mean? That they're not... They, they don't they're tell not, each other enough stuff about what's going on. The problems that they yeah. face. They have assumptions. More than listening yeah. to the other person, you have your own assumptions that you bring to the table, and then you want them to meet it. And when it doesn't mean it causes a disagreement. So now that's slightly different. That's an expectation. That's, that's an expectation gap. So maybe that's now the cause of breakup. I came in with a set of expectations. My expectations are met, therefore, I feel like the grass is green on that side. Yeah? Lack of so communication. That's, let me just put that in one box. Okay. Lack of communication. Lack of communication between, let's say, me and her, for example. If I've got a problem, I wouldn't tell her what the problem is. I would go and tell someone else. And, and so you wouldn't be able, so what's going on inside here, you aren't able to communicate you aren't able to say the words to explain rather than not able to it's just this bit of uh, i think there's there's an element of eagerness involved here as well that maybe i don't need to tell her what i'm going through i'll just go and tell someone else and ask them to make me feel happy about it and then so what is the reason a couple a husband wouldn't be able to tell the wife uh because you won't either want to offend them or so for example let's say uh, oh, well, that would, that would come into lying now. I don't want to give away that I've been lying to you. <laughs> uh, but this is interesting. We keep hearing breakdown of communication, but in actual words. And so it's pretty tough, right? To understand actually breakdown. So uh, let me try and put this in one box. We'll cover this in something called the five love languages. And for the purpose of this, we'll just talk about the breakdown of communicating love between each other. And there's generally five ways we tend to communicate love. And it's a lovely book uh, written by a faith-based person called Gary Chapman. Uh, he's a faith-based counselor from the Christian faith, from the Abrahamic faith. And he's written a beautiful book on how we communicate love in five ways. And I know the breakdown of communication is a, it's quite a broad topic. But one of the ways that sometimes we disconnect is A is seeking to be loved in a certain way and we're not communicating the right love language in inverted commas. Okay, so we'll come to that. Um, so I just want to pick up on one thing. I mean, um, this whole concept of preparation for marriage, 
uh, and it's very similar to parenting as well. That whenever we, these are probably the two biggest steps we take in our lives. The process of spending our lives with someone. Okay? Suddenly from nowhere, having a single bed or even a double bed with no one next to you. Overnight, someone's almost planted next to you. And you're almost expected to know based on what you've seen. Okay? Now, some of us are very fortunate. We may have seen a very functional, very loving relationship between mum and dad. Some of us have seen a loving relationship, but within that love, we may have seen a lot of conflict between the mum and dad. Okay? Um, so we've seen love and conflict. In some of the households, we've seen a lot of uh, issues being sorted out by anger. And almost like a blame culture. If something happens in the home, dad would absolutely have a go at mom. For either forgetting to pay the bill or forgetting to do something or not having done something she was maybe not even politely asked to do, ordered to do by dad. Okay? Um, and within a partic in a particular home, some of us may have seen love communicated, but not the love we would have been craving for when we were growing up. And a lot of times, maybe, and you can relate to this, is you look, you're looking at that and you're saying to yourself, you know what, when I grow up and I get married, I want to take the good bits from this. I really don't want to emulate this from mom and dad or uncle, auntie, or whoever you've seen growing up and then some of them you said I you know I can't this is like the good the bad and the really ugly yeah. okay so a it needs awareness B it then needs conscious effort here's the question so a lot of us who lead our lives again Rizan how did you get here today how did I get here after work I took the train to Nisden and so how did you get to work in the morning took the train to work okay can you describe your journey from your walk to the station from my walk to the station did you walk to the station yeah yeah yeah. can you describe your walk <laughs> it's pretty dull <laughs> I just come out of the house and I walk what did you notice on the way there nothing really <laughs> you just where was your mind when you're walking I definitely wasn't on walking so it's you're just, pretty you're just doing it because you're so used to it. You're in autopilot you're mode. Right? You're thinking about work. You're thinking about what I'm going to be doing on the show tonight. Were you consciously <laughs> Were you consciously aware of things happening around you? No, I wouldn't say I was. All right, let's take aware. the almost classic. You went to pray just before we we came on the show, right? Yeah. How much of that prayer? Oh dear. Yeah, I can relate to this. I I said my. Salah this evening and had the same thing. I'd, Allah Akbar. Right, I've got to prepare for the show. What time do I have to get? <laughs> right? Before we knew, oh my God, what rakat am I on? First, second, third. Right? Okay. Conscious behavior or subconscious? Subconscious. Subconscious, subconscious right? So, guess what? This power of ob observation come into a relationship. Saw this in a relationship before me, mom and dad. This is how they loved each other, how they dealt with conflict, anger, whatever it is. Consciously, I'm saying I don't want to emulate this. How much of our life is subconscious and conscious? In the sense, whatever we do, half of it is like subconsciously, like the walk to the station, we're thinking about other things. So the same way we bring that to our marriage in a very sub, like we may um, approach marriage in a subconscious mind. So I'd like to bring that, I'd like to change the way I approach marriage or at least make it better by consciously making an effort as much as I can in the things I do in my marriage. Now, a lot of people generally ask, what are the causes or the challenges people face in marriage? And what do you think this is actually? What is I trying to relate to? What are the causes? Yeah, so, you know, what are the... When we discuss causes of breakups, one came out communication, breakdown. Mm. The other one was expectation gap. And we'll discuss expectation gap because it's amazing 
this concept of expectation gap when you actually explore it mm. what an expectation gap means and I'll, I'll, I will come on to this expectation gap and how they're formed in it but the other one and I like I almost put in another box known I try and call it past relationships and often when I use the word past relationships in a workshop people almost think that we're going to open up a whole Pandora's box okay we're going to open their Facebook all their previous messages etc etc what am I actually referring to past relationships what you've seen when you've been growing up your parents your experience people in your family people you're close to absolutely so it's as I growing up I take this rucksack on me this baggage Something's happened in my life and I've carried it on me. I've seen this fight between mum and dad and it's sad with me, etc, etc, etc. Okay, so I've come up with this whole, whatever you want to call it, baggage, rucksack, me, my past. You have your other half who's come back with their whole set of their own life and baggages and everything they saw growing up. And you come into a relationship, okay? That's one. The other one is the actual relationship between us and our own parents. How does that impact in marriage? So this is a, you're saying this is a cause of relationship breakdown? We'll see if it is. We'll see if it is. And that's what we're exploring, right? Mm. I think everyone goes through their own personal internal journey and their own personal reflections. And, and therefore, um, I probably won't get stereotypical answers, but I do sometimes get quite a common reaction that it's almost like sometimes uh, a light is switched on or something just uh, something they've connected with something that's been said. So I tend to get that kind of reaction, but never a stereotypical answer because everyone's got their own um, their own lens and they're always looking at it. They're always processing the information through their own way because it's quite an interactive process. And I think I found the same today as well. And I just want to briefly see how how, if any, would that impact into a marriage? Well, the, the classic case is the over-possessive mother. Okay, so over-possessive mother. Yeah. What's the implication of an over-possessive mother? A son who is trying to spend time with his wife, but at the cost of damaging relationship with his mom, and then he's kind of like stuck in a position where he needs to choose almost. Like he's being forced to choose, and he can't choose, because obviously it's a different kind of love to both of them, right? Okay. So you, that's very interesting, okay? So you got, that's another, I'll put it in a slightly different box. You got a mother who looks at her son as what? A child? Well, yeah. And therefore, in, in the, in the there's over-possessiveness. Yeah. So that relationship hasn't formed into an adult-adult. So still maintaining a lot of control. Mm -hmm, possibly. Right? Yeah. And then he's stuck in the middle and he's got, which is true, okay? Keep that in one box for a minute. Let's just call that interference. Because we've got the other scenario, we've got the, the lady who's coming to the house. It's got her mum. Okay. Still got very close bond with that daughter of hers. Wants to see how she's doing on a daily basis, mm -hmm. etc., etc. Okay, how she's getting along. How the, the daughter is not showing up the mother now. Mm -hmm. Are you cooking properly? Are you making him happy? What's going on at home? How come you... Okay, so you've got that dynamic. Um, but come back to... And I think us men tend to have this issue. Um, especially, I guess, the more I've had the, the opportunity of doing this. We always start off the workshops asking the, whoever's attending, what three questions would you want to walk away answered from this? And put an asterisk against one. And it's amazing how many ladies put down, how do I deal with a husband who's got anger management issues? How do I deal with a husband? And I think it works both ways now. I think you also find the husband's having the same issue. How do we deal with people who've got temper issues? Where is one of the sources of that temper? The 
parents or something. So, so, so your, you, your family. Yeah, so watching, you may have seen your parents. Yeah, and you would internalize that. Yeah? And project it in your relationship later, so. Absolutely. So that's one of them. So you've actually watched it and you thought that's the only way the conflict is. This whole concept of conflict resolved just by anger, by shouting, by force, right? The other one is, uh, and let's just come to this love language now, is always this feeling that, um, I wish I had a better connection with my parents. Right? I wish love between my parents and I was a lot closer. Um, I wish that bond was closer with my dad. That I could have had that, you know, when I see another father and son spending quality time with each other. I wish I had that bond um, with my with my father or my mom. How does that impact when we feel like we don't have that connection with our parents? How does that impact our self-confidence? I guess it's difficult unless you've been through it to know how it would actually feel. Okay, if you were put in the position, do you know anyone who may, would you know anyone who's adopted, for example? So I have neighbors who've taken on two children or adopted. In fact, I come from a family where my older brother has been adopted. Okay, what did they always say? I was even watching a, the program on ITV or Channel 4. I think it's missing my family or looking for my... They always want to know who their real parents are, that's something they always find themselves wanting to do. Then want to find that missing link, right? I think, I've, I guess you always find that whenever there's that closeness missing, you always feel like a sense of low self-esteem. That's one of the sources they say, is when the, the bond between parent, son, parent, daughter, isn't as strong as it, they wanted it to be. They feel they're not good enough which then manifests itself in anger towards themselves, which they then project to the person they're now staying with. It's anger that's facing towards them, my mom and dad there, I wish you gave me more time, I wish you the thing. And not dealing with that unhealed relationship, can't cope with it, and then you take it out here. Okay, and I'm you know, I've been in the, a position that I do know a couple of people who've always struggled with this issue. That they've never healed that relationship, that unmet need. And it's manifested itself in, in this. So I guess how you deal with that is a completely separate, but it, there is a lovely process to go through. That, okay? That's another cause of... Um, uh, of uh, Marriage breakdown. Marriage breakdown. So, here's one before we go into this five love language, which I absolutely love. I mean, it was a real breakthrough for myself. Um, it really helped me with my own parents, actually, when I, when I broke down the five love language model. Um, and it helped me really reconcile in my own family and my own, uh, my own process as well. But... The model of marriage, okay, this concept of marriage. Behind every successful man there is a woman. Okay. Which is which concept? Where's where have we heard that? Oh in, in the Western books or so would you consider that as Western phraseology? Well, I've never heard of it in an Islamic context, have I? Don't think so. So what is the Islamic based model of marriage? A mother. Well, I guess that's all as well. <laughs> well, no one's behind anyone, we're kind of together. Yeah, exactly. So what's the Islamic model? If, if you were to put that as a, a similar phrase, what would you say? So, I don't know, man and wife are together. Behind every successful man is a successful relationship or something. Okay. So you're kind of making it... What about the equalized. counter? So behind every successful man, there's a... Woman, so the woman is a man. Okay, did that make sense? Mm. Where have we seen that model in our own 
That's one. Even before that. Prophet Khadija. Who? Prophet Baby Khadija. Okay. So this is an absolute classic. We hear this constantly. Lady Khadija? Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad, right? One plus one? Two. Oh, two. Well, I don't know. Synergy three. <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to get me to say here. <laughs> there is no right or wrong answer. That's the beauty of it. Fourteen. <laughs> so one plus one, fourteen? Well, very, very good. Yeah? Yeah. So the power of marriage, that just the one plus one to you is 14, right? Mm. What would you say that when you think of the man, the Holy Prophet, Lady Khadija, what has that created, that one plus one? You, you can't confine it to a number. How come? Because they're, I don't know, they were just, they were powerful together, so, so I guess infinity. So it's unmeasurable. Why is it unmeasurable? You can't value it. Put a number to it. Because you always account to it by profession. Oh, what do you do with a number 14? I think that's a brilliant one. So you've gone for 14. <laughs> what number would you go for? What would you go for, Zahra? I'd go for 1. Well, my answer was 14, and her answer was 1. So 1 plus 1 equals 1, which I thought was quite a nice uh, philosophical answer to the question. And uh, it gave me a, a new perspective into the way she's thinking about things. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So you've gone for quite a philosophical... <laughs> Stance, right? Explain your one plus one. Why does that equal one? So together they're one, as in someone is half and the other person's half, and then together they're a whole one. Absolutely. So you've looked at it quite a. So we'll come to this as well, okay? How one plus one, so a half and half, they created one. But what is that one unit or one team created? Or one partnership created? What did they generate? What did they generate in a number? A nation, a, a community, a family. a family, a family, 14. The whole Islamic movement that as we speak now is probably multiplying too. Right? Mm -hmm. If you to put that in a corporation, a company, a corporate, that's the power of that partnership. CEO at the top, what would you term Lady Khadija, the president, okay, and the movement that they've created. Without Muhammad Khadija, right, mm -hmm. so she brought her business acumen, her strategic acumen, he brought his uh, personality to the table, his charisma to the table, and the movement they've created, okay, which is the next man-woman partnership that was so powerful. Even after that, that, Saddam said that I cannot make the same mistake his uncle made and he took off Minta Huda, who was a sister of Shaykh Bakr al Sadr, right? He says, I can't afford to make the same mistake. Which is which movement? Which brother sister one? The power of that partnership, the man woman partnership, okay? So this is interesting. One plus one is actually two billion and counting. Twenty billion counting. The power of a partnership, right? Here's the flip side of it. What can one plus one also equal? So if it all falls apart, then zero, I guess. You can actually go minus. Minus one. See, here you had the man brought out the best of Lady Khadija, and Khadija bring, brought out the best of Muhammad. You can then have Rizwan and Zahra, for example, and that person can bring the worst out of that person, and she can bring the worst out of him. So I came in as a whole person into this marriage, came into, and I've actually gone away as a broken person. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the power this partnership can have, but also the destruction this partnership can have. So here's this question, okay? What can or what should be the only reason for marriage breakup? I don't know. My, my, instead of blaming others for marriage breakup, I always like to think internally or to look internally. And one area I've been observing 
of I've been giving it much thought is not knowing your role and responsibility as a husband or as a wife. And as soon as you recognize what your duties are towards one another, um, then I think uh, you, you're unbreakable. So for example, if I know, you know, by default, it's not her duty to wash the dishes, or it's not her duty to cook, or it's not her duty to not do that. And even if she doesn't do it, and even if my manly instinct tell me or arouse me to get angry at her, at the back of my mind, I always tell myself, well, this isn't her duty anyway, so relax. So that's my perception towards uh, or trying to avoid one of the ways of breaking up is to know what your limits are, what your responsibilities are, what your roles are, and, and vice versa from, from her end. Okay, so knowing, so extrapolate that a bit more, okay? So knowing your duties, responsibilities, so that's almost going with uh, a chart flow format, right? What else do you bring to the table? Well, from that, what I can take from that is that I, I, I therefore appreciate her more, right? So, for example, if I know it's not her duty and yet she goes ahead and does it, it makes me appreciate her efforts even, even more sincerely, right? So, so for that particular day, I'm not going to get angry at, you know, like, for example, she makes you breakfast, right? Every morning. <laughs> yeah, she and does. one day she doesn't wake up and do it. All right. No, but it just makes you love her even more, right? And I know that, you know what, I'm not going to get angry at her for the rest of the day because, yeah. look, she's, like, she's gone out of her way to make okay. your breakfast. And so that, and, so and, and, that's and that, another beautiful no, love on, language. But that's not me trying to, uh, I'm, I'm not demanding it from her. She does it very lovingly. And I, yeah. I, I, I appreciate that, but I, I know it. That, you know what, this is how much this person loves me, that, you know, she knows she is, it's not her duty to make breakfast, yet she does it. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, so, uh, not, so knowing that it's not her duty and when she does do it, she goes out of her way to do it, you, ex you appreciate it even more and you, I, I guess you increase the bond even further. That's what I have learned from now until... So, well, we'll yeah. so you've tapped on again another beautiful concept, one of the love language concepts, which we will come to, I promise. <laughs> But uh, we'll remember this example of someone actually, especially in London, called in Toronto too, coming out of bed and actually taking that effort to lovingly make someone breakfast, okay? So put that in one. Um, I just want to come to this point on um, this concept of interference, another common reason for breakups or a challenge that we face. When I say interference, what do you take away from that? What is interference? Or what are the modes of interference in our marriages at the moment? I guess like friends, family. Okay, so friends, family. Yeah. Um, there's more. <laughs> Possibly. Um, I don't know. It's Cinema, watching movies. You can okay. get interference. Media, media, I guess. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'll never accept the first answer. They always try and what does that actually mean? What does it mean for you? Um, and and that's where it it it, it uh, that's what I can't prepare for. But what I do prepare for is uh, the base principles of how to make those real, how to make them real life, how to bring them home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Colleagues, people at work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where's my phone? You always have your phone on you. <laughs> This? Communication. Yeah. Okay. So actually, Facebook, etc., etc. You've just seen a status of a couple checking into a restaurant in central London, whatever it is, yeah. expressing their love on Facebook on their first anniversary. <laughs> and you just had Hussein on Ahlul Bay TV <laughs> having to anchor a show on your anniversary night. <laughs> Thank you're in that status. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, yeah. In-laws, classic one. Siblings. Whose fault is it? Whose fault is interference? I think it's the way you deal with it. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. So it's how we process that information, right? But if I was to take this oh, and chuck it, okay. yeah? <laughs> If I was to chuck that phone, what would you do instinctively at you? Yeah, I'd block it. And, you know, so you'd block the interference, or you'd block this thing coming at you? Yeah. Right or wrong? Yeah. And if I really to chuck it, if I chuck the pillow, you have a choice of actually... Sheltering yourself. Yeah. Or putting them away. 
So what about the people? Common issue of breakup, too much in-laws interference or too much parental interference. What does that mean about the person? Or what is the issue there? Parental interference. Parental interference, in-law interference, friend interference, um, peer pressure. And you're close to them, as in you want to feel attached to them as well. And you want them to be involved in your life. And your relationship is a major part of your life at the moment. So you'd want to, you'd want for them to speak to you about it or to ask you things about it. And then you'd be telling them stuff. And then that's how it causes interference. Absolutely. So, you, so one way is you've actually invited it. Okay. You've actually invited that interference in inverted commas. And that person in good faith was actually, because you've asked their opinion or their advice, etc., etc. They've in good faith given that advice. And then you've become, you've formed a relationship with that person. And another issue, and you've asked for more advice, okay? And you've continued to invite that uh, interference into the thing. See, I think one of the things, and I say this also from my own personal experience, is I'll tell you one of, if you if we were to break down the one of the root causes that are happening at the moment in, in marriage breakup, it's possibly that when two people are getting married, they still, they haven't evolved into the adult phase of their life. They're still in the process of evil evolving to adult phase, or they're still in the child mode. What do I mean by that child mode phase? So when you have a problem, you go and tell someone else. You go and tell your parents, you tell your friends. Because before you're married, when you have a problem, that's what you do. Yeah. So you don't think, oh, hold on, how is this going to impact my relationship? You just quickly go and tell everyone about it. So you just want someone to solve it. Yeah. yeah? Or you've always been of that thing that you've always needed validation because you've never trusted yourself. You always need that validation. Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? When you have that sort of conversation, you're never seeking answers from that person and you're never expecting them to give you answers uh, because that approach in itself has a flaw because you almost assume, you're almost assuming or you're giving away responsibility or control of your life. What you're actually dying is just, doing is just reflecting with that person. And the other one is it's very difficult to take to undertake that process of responsibility, being responsible for your own. Uh, and I say this from my own experience too, that to consciously move into an adult phase of your life means to consciously take responsibility of this person here. But this person here will ultimately know what's good for them and not good for them. This person will ultimately know uh, what what course of action is good or not good. Does that make sense? But it's that, con it's, it's that constant thing that let me just go and ask because you feel that they either know more or you've always been addicted that let me just clarify this with big brother, big etc, etc, etc. But how does this reconcile to the concept of getting uh, advice? Because this is where I was saying, Hussein, you'll never walk alone. How does that link into that phrase? Because yeah, you're always with your spouse. Well, That's one. You're always with your spouse. What's another? What, what do you think I meant by this? You'll never walk alone. Because you always have someone with you that you should revert back to in terms of need. You should always have that one person. Yeah. You are never alone. Absolutely. You know, I think one of the hardest, one of the saddest things I found, even again I refer, is that we have this tendency of suffering alone. We have this real tendency of whenever we have an issue with our other half, our parents, or our parents have issues with sons, they tend to suffer alone for the fear of 
being judged. If I tell this one, the word will spread, etc., etc. Yeah. Issue with that, um, when you suffer like that on your own, the other cause of marriage breakup is the slow poison syndrome. That you suffer, 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 and then you have nowhere to turn to. And I'll tell you, the sad thing is, is uh, the intimate interaction between the man and the woman is a hu huge issue, especially in our Indian community, in our Asian community. That this expectation, there's so many expectations built that the intimate interaction between a man and a woman will be this based on whatever you've collected along the way, okay? Now, if I was to tell you that there are couples who take up to six months to 12 months to consummate their marriage, okay? I know couples who've taken up to 24 months to consummate their marriage. On the verge of possibly breaking up because they felt that this is abnormal. But this is one of those things that had they suffered on their own, they would have really suffered immensely, okay? But they, there's avenues out there. Relate is a classic that offers psychosexual therapy um, for, for something like this. The difficulty of consummation. And this, for me, that's quite a, an area of pain when I see people suffering on this angle because they don't know where to turn for, for help. How many of you have read a book and then gone to watch that same book in a movie? Mm -hmm. Harry Potter. Yeah, Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. Read the book first? Read the book first. And then watch the movie? Yes. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't read. I don't read. Harry Potter is... The chocolate factory. You read the book first? I Roald Dahl so. one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you watch the movie. Mm. Any others? Hunger Games. You watch the... Uh, read I the read book. the book first, then okay. watch the movie. Okay, any others? Okay, so uh, let's go Harry Potter. How about this Mukhtar narrative? My way. Oh, <laughs> has that? I learned it in Madrasa. In, 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 the in theory, and I watched it. Prophet Yusuf as well. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't I read it in, in Madrasa, in Quran, and stuff about and it, and then watched the movie. movie. Fantastic. Mashallah. You're saying the right things in front of. <laughs> so, so come, come to Harry Potter. Yes. Right? What was the movie like compared to the book? No. It was horrible in comparison. It was rubbish. It was okay. I mean, it didn't do justice to the book. No. It didn't do justice to the book? No. So you thought the movie was pretty poor, right? Yeah, it was. Okay. I watched The Da Vinci Code in the movie. Never read the book. Absolutely loved the movie. Okay? person sitting next to me ru almost ruined the movie for me because that person kept getting annoyed, complaining, etc., etc. That person who read the book, came into the movie, hated the movie. I loved it. How is that linked to the concept of marriage? Reading about marriage. I don't know, reading books about marriage and then preparing for marriage. Going into Going, expectations. To be honest, I, I haven't read anything about marriage prior. I read, just, seen, nothing. however you want to ob I, observation. I just, I just observed in terms of uh, how to deal with it in certain situations and you know, look at a father figure, let's see how he deals with his kids and stuff like that. Yeah. But read about it theoretically through literature, I haven't known. Yeah, but, but it, it's interesting how sub consciously, subconsciously, however you want to say, and there's no right or wrong expectation, right? Expe expecta you can't say this is a right expectation to have a wrong expectation. The point is we still walk in with expectations, whatever they are. Where they come from, could be from mates at work, could be from whatever we watch, etc, etc. But it's just to be aware that the more we built up, the more naturally, when we walk into something, either they'll be met, exceeded or not met. So it's just, just from that, you can just, just a simple example. And especially the intimate interaction. Man. I think that's probably, and I don't, so, so one of the things we do do in the workshops is actually have a separate breakup where men get a chance to uh, discuss this in a very dignified way and the women folk have a very have a chance to discuss this in a very dignified way because this is somewhere where I know a lot of people um, tend to have issues and majority of it and it's not only in our it's not only a Muslim or in our culture 
it's the culture that is prevalent that drives a certain expectation and um when you actually uh, engage or when you actually have the intimate interaction in it that's sometimes where there's a huge expectation gap okay um maybe we could if we have time we may discuss it when we know but now coming to the five love language and how that also has an expectation gap so here's the thing breakdown of communication how do we actually communicate love to each other verbally okay verbally give me an example of verbal you say i love you to your wife so i love you yeah i love you too you say that's one right what's another one so that's that's actual verbal the use of words to do what what are you doing to me when you say it? you convey your feelings okay so you're conveying your feelings mm. in this case through words So what are you doing to that person through your words? You're informing them of your <laughs> of your thoughts. <laughs> informing even another without the word informing you're expressing I don't know um you yeah. affirming that person. You actually affirming that person by the words and the love language is words of affirmation. Other words of affirmation. Like other ways? Yeah. Actual words of affirmation. So I love you. I like you. I like you. I want you. You're great. You're great. <laughs> I care about you. I care about you. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You mean a lot to me. <laughs> It's amazing because so to so, so some you may feel these are uh, the food you've cooked is really nice what you did. Mm. Like I really appreciate. So complimenting? Mm. Complimenting I really through the not. use of words. Yeah. writing well, now we got these emoticons and whatever it is <laughs> okay writing i think is a lost art but that's also amazing written um um affirmation i think another one we don't say enough of is i respect you for i respect this quality in you cuz guess what that does what happens when you actually a firm a quality in a person so give me a, a quality you really respect about zahra politeness so how would you put that if you were to say to the how would you say that? i respect you i respect your politeness what else uh give I me do. another quality that you've seen in her uh caring thoughtful uh So guess what you're not doing? It's not outcome driven. It's not about you. Yeah, it's not about me. So it's respecting the quality in her. It's not that I respect you because you've done this for me. Correct. So guess what that quality does? Let me give you an example of why this is so um this is such a subtle difference with, to me it, it when I got it I found it pretty profound. Right? I used to keep telling my son who's saying yeah, he's 8 years old. absolute football fanatic okay complete nut and every time he would play well or something i'd say i'm really proud of you and then i attended one of these uh, when i was doing my certification for this parent is team coach my tutor said from th- today on you will never use the word i am proud of you i said what i use it i said i would love it if my dad would say that to me mm. i'm proud of you and she asked me a question i said who is that pride about about yourself. How he is making you feel. Mm. One. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing is, she said to me is So hold on. So you make me proud. Is yeah, that I am proud of you. So who is that pride about? Yours, it's your pride. It's your pride that he has made you feel proud. Right. So you make so you should say you make me proud. Or so that's one. The other thing with pride is it's what? It's outcome driven. So that person feels that if I keep doing something then I will be my dad will be proud of me or my husband will be proud of me. Mm-hmm. So the mode so it, I need to do she said change it to say I respect that quality in you. So for example I'm proud I'm actually proud of myself because he's got this tenacity in him, right? He's like a dog with a bone he will never give up. 
okay? And I said that I respect this quality in you that you never ever give up. Whether you're losing 2-0, you're losing 4-0, 6-0, you'll keep going right till the end. Guess what that does to him now? Will it only um, confine him to football? Or where will that quality... So if he knows my dad respects that quality in me... It will take you into other places. In faith, aspects of faith when he's learning his Quran, aspect of the Quran, uh, in any other aspect of his life, because he knows someone respects that quality in me and he believes in me. Does that make sense? That mm-hmm. subtle, but to me it was really, really quite um, touching actually. So that's words of affirmation, written or spoken. Instead of telling his son that he's proud of him and kind of making it about himself, he, he made it about his son and his son's ability to, uh, his son's ability to kind of be good at sports and stuff like that. So I think instead of complimenting Hussein in a way that kind of makes me, like as if he's making me happy, like I'm going to try and compliment him in a way that's going to kind of make him want to enhance his abilities in whatever he's doing, but in other spheres of life as well. What's another one? Physical. Physical touch. Okay. Which is what? Hugging. Hugging. Kissing. What are other physical touch? Pat on the back. Pat on the back. The high fives. Yeah. Yeah.